Let's talk about big banks today, what this may look like in terms of the overall financial conditions of the United States and also globally when you look at what has happened within the banking system and some experts out there, including other bankers, starting to look at this as maybe not necessarily a stable position. We're going to take a look at that. We'll also drill down into what's happening more on a global aspect of this. Obviously, if you guys are investors out there, you're wanting to get all of these kinds of news topics. So we want to bring to you guys a little different spin today uh, with some different voices out there. So we'll dive in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. Joining me today is Michael Green. He's a CFA, port, a CFA and portfolio manager over at Simplify. Great to have you on the show, Mike. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Paul. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks again. We had a chance to chat uh, before coming on air a little bit and, and learned a little bit more about your background uh, within the finance community. But more importantly, is I think a lot of people would look at, you know, maybe some of the things you've done around both Bitcoin gold values as well as traditional investing. What I want to dive in today uh, on is really about the banking uh, situation. Obviously, with what's happened with Silicon Valley, Silvergate, all of these scenarios have started to play out. We've seen additional banks, including Credit Suisse, Deutsche, and many others that are starting to kind of uh, waver a bit here. I wanted to get your opinion of what you think is going on in the current uh, banking scenario. Well, what's happening right now is that you're seeing deposits drained out of the banking system and into primarily money market funds. So there's a big focus on the failures of Silicon Valley Bank, the failure of, and or takeover of Signature Bank, uh, Credit Suisse has been, a, you know, walking wounded for an extended period of time. It's takeover by UBS is theoretically a resolution in that direction. The challenge is, is that all of this is being created by the complexity that's created in a, you know, financial system that involves money that's going from one location to another. In this situation, what we've seen is the Federal Reserve interest rates dramatically in a manner that is largely unprecedented. They've hiked them to try to address the fears or concerns around inflation and an economy that was running too hot. The problem is as those higher interest rates begin to slow the economy, it also is further exacerbating the condition by drawing assets out of the banking sector and putting them directly into things like money market funds that are, you can think of as similar to banks, right? You, you create an account, you own a security in a way that when you have a deposit at a bank, you are now the owner of an obligation or a liability from that bank. A money market fund is not all that different, except a money market fund is extraordinarily narrow in the way that it utilizes that money. Basically, all it does is go out and finance the U.S. government. And so what we've seen is with the U.S. government raising the rate that is compensating investors through treasuries, we're now seeing that money drawn out of the banking system that reduces the amount of capital or credit that would be available to things like the auto industry, to a much right. lesser extent, the housing market, which is heavily influenced by federal, but very heavily affecting things like commercial, uh, commercial real estate, where the majority of the lending activity is actually happening in the smaller and regional banks that are primarily accessing capital through that, that deposit base, you know, that's setting up kind of the next stage of this, which is we don't know what the world looks like as we start to withdraw the various forms of credit that we've extended. All right. So the, a lot to unpack there, Mike. Uh, yeah, unfortunately you, there is. It's a complicated yeah. topic. So, so you look at the credit, that, that kind of translates as a potential credit crunch for business as well as the, you know, the commercial real estate scenarios that may, may be playing out overall. Now, there are some analysts out there that believe that maybe this is slowing down. Back to your point, money now funneling out of what usually is deposit accounts, moving into brokerage accounts, flipping over into money markets getting that nice yield on those short-term treasuries. The opportunity there, though, is this may flip around and maybe look at an exodus of those scenarios, because again, obviously, if you're in a brokerage account, you get a little bit more in SIPC insurance versus you know FDIC insurance, so you can play with a little bit more money there if you're a big guy. And if you're a small investor, people are moving that because there's a pretty nice yield right now on T-bills. With that being the case, I was looking at a tweet over here by Robin Brooks. This guy's former Goldman Sachs. He says, falling bank deposits, much to your point, among U.S. big U.S. banks are not necessarily a bank run. Fred's hiked rates, back to your point, uh, are just a knockoff effect on this tightening. Um, there were a lot of big post-SVB outflows for small banks. 
Uh, but the, he thinks that they've somewhat ended here. Do you feel that that is the case, or do you think we're going to continue to see some more exodus? Yeah, I, I continue to think that we'll see exodus, and and for the very simple reason that we've not narrowed that gap. And if anything, we've actually functioned to make people more aware of it, right? So it's referred to as the Streisand effect by raising their hands and saying, oh, gosh, you, you know, we understand why people might want to withdraw money from banks. Um, either it's because of a lack of deposit insurance, which is not the concern for the vast majority of individuals, right? The $250,000 coverage is more than adequate for the vast majority of individuals. But what we did do is we said, oh, guess what? And people are making so much more money in money market funds. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that the number of people sitting around the kitchen table saying, wait a second, is that really true? Can we move our money from the bank into a money market fund and make 5% instead of 0.5%? That awareness has risen and you can't put the genie back in the bottle unless you dramatically change those characteristics. So we, so yes, Mike we have stemmed the immediate deposit outflow We've taken the underlying dynamic associated with the credit crisis or the Silicon Valley bank crisis. You know, we address that in a very short form, but we haven't addressed the much broader issue of the most attractive, you know, entity that you can lend to in this current environment is risk-free to the U.S. government. Right. Yeah, for sure. So the credit crunch that could be looming here, this is going to make it smaller or more uh, difficult for small business to essentially go get funds from a bank because the the flow, obviously the banks will get tighter within their credit decisions. <clears throat> Additionally within that, you've got CRE coming in. This will be a bigger play because this could have much more rolling effects in the economy. Kind of play this out over the next 12 months along with what the Fed is doing with potentially maybe pausing rate hikes, or do you think they will? What do you think the next six to 12 months might look like? So I lost you for part of that. I think you were just asking me to roll forward for what the next six to 12 months looks like. Is that, yes. is in, that a fair yeah. assessment? Yes, in reference to credit pressure from these banks losing deposits, so not as much yeah. money available to lend, and the potential of the Fed possibly pausing or maybe reversing rates rate increases? So at this point, the Fed has been very clear that they do not anticipate either pausing or reducing rates, cutting rates, even though the market is currently saying they're wrong and they're gonna be forced to acknowledge that, that's not their current plan. So we, let's operate under two separate formats, right? One is, is that the Fed continues to hike interest rates. If that's the case, then the financing of the U.S. government becomes even more attractive relative to alternatives, right? So why take any risks when I can get near 5% on a risk-free basis? Some of your viewers may turn around and say, well, but that's not really 5% because inflation is running 4%, 5%, 6%, whatever you think the actual number is. Therefore, I'm not getting a real yield. But that real yield is actually high relative to what you could expect from other asset classes, right? So right, the spreads negative. between exactly, right? So when you when you think about that dynamic, you know that you're losing money in bank deposits. I don't see any reason to expect for flows to reverse themselves. It's what's called the beta of deposits, or the deposit beta to that spread between the interest rates. It takes time for people to wake up to that, but once they've woken up to it, then the chain start the change starts to accelerate. That means that money will be pulled out of the banking system throughout 2023, assuming the Fed continues to hike rates, or even if the Fed were to pause, that differential still exists. You'll likely see more money coming out of the banking system going into money market funds. That creates credit tightness in the sectors that we were referring to, CRE, auto financing, various other areas, right? Particularly like equipment finance for smaller businesses. If you're a right. pizza shop and you want to go get a new pizza oven, you go for a loan to the local bank. You don't hit the bond market. You don't issue tokens. You don't do all sorts of things, right? It's just a very standard relationship. That's going to become much more difficult. We've seen that already in the senior loan officer surveys, they've suggested that they're tightening credit significantly even before the events of Silicon Valley, right? Yeah, exactly. So under most circumstances, we should expect that credit will get tighter over the course of the year. As we approach the end of 2023, 
we're beginning to run into what's called the refinancing wall for many of the companies that financed themselves in 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. Their interest rates at that point were in the low twos. In many situations, they were financing themselves. You know, if they were a high risk entity, like a high yield firm, they could finance themselves in the fours, which is truly unprecedented. Now you're looking at those interest expenses doubling that in turn is going to place additional pressure on business profitability, likely begins to hit the unemployment market, et cetera, which is already experiencing some weakness if you properly define the data sets. The rates of unemployment for those who have college degrees bottomed back in September of last year, for those that um, have less than a college degree and are typically more involved in blue collar industries, you can actually hear workers working on my house in the background. You know, there continues to be a relative shortage there, but even there, we're starting to see some deterioration. Yesterday's ISM data in the manufacturing sector, which should be experiencing a significant tailwind given the dynamics of separating from China and onshoring, we're just not seeing any evidence of it. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the base case, as you should expect that. Now, there's additional things that are going to kick in in a very unfortunate manner. We've all, we're all familiar with the dynamics of the debt ceiling, right? So the debt ceiling has an interesting characteristic to it. If you're trying to prevent the government from borrowing, what Janet Yellen as Treasury Secretary has done is the equivalent of draw down the cash reserves, what's referred to as the Treasury General Account, right? If you think about accessing credit or paying for things, I can do it in two ways. I can use my credit card and pay that off at some point into the future, or I can right. use cash in my wallet, right? If I have a hard limit on my credit, in other words, I've bumped up against the limits on my credit card, I have to start using the cash from my wallet, right? That's what Janet Yellen's been doing, it's called drawing down the Treasury General account. That in turn has been providing liquidity to the system, so it's not straining anybody else, competing for those credit resources, et cetera. And ironically, if we resolve the debt ceiling, regardless of, I mean, the worst case scenario is, is that we decide, hey, we're going to put a hard stop. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. all the government spending stops. We experience the shutdown. It takes a very painful hit. But even if we resolve it, right, even if we get to the point that we say, OK, we're going to lift that credit limit. The next thing that's going to happen is Janet Yellen is going to go out and restock that checking account, refill the wallet. It means she's going to go and borrow a whole bunch of money that's going to create additional demand or demand that has to be filled for treasuries before anything else, right? So more right. pressure, more competing for that credit dollar is going to come from the government in the second half of the year. All of that together creates conditions under which it's very hard not to see a significant negative credit impulse that is flowing through the economy and affecting basically everything that is bought on credit, whether that's houses or autos or equipment or computers. You've just seen Apple announce that they're getting into the financing business for iPhones. Well, why do you think that is? That doesn't happen when there's unlimited demand. They're saying people can't access or afford our products. So we're going to try to finance it. Right? It's telling you the economy is weakening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with that, uh, you're right. We, we get to a scenario right now where this starts to have the trickle down yeah. effects. This was you know, right here from Roger, Watcher Guru talking about U.S. job openings falling to 9.93. This was lower than expected. So back to your point, lowering job expectations out there for small business, which can't now get access to grow their own businesses. This will start to put some pressure on it. If you look at this, this could slow down inflation in a very big way, kind of intrinsically of how all of these factors might be affected. How do you think the U.S. fares when you look at what's happening in China? We just saw Tesla's numbers skyrocket through China. Lower inflation numbers coming out of China. Now we've got Chinese uh, you know, deals being done with everything from the Russians to the Saudis around where oil, as well as just some of the general merchant deals that they're starting to cut outside the U.S. dollar. How do you think this starts to play for the United States on more of a global scale, especially with what's happening right now with us leading into this maybe uh, credit crisis toward the end of the year? Well, I think this is part of the frustration, right? So, so many of us are critical of the US government and its priorities and the way that it's handling itself on the international stage. Mm -hmm. And we're naturally drawn to you know, news of competition coming from China, et cetera. 
most of the evidence that I'm seeing suggests that China and the Saudis and others are actually operating from a position of significant weakness. You don't cut production in order to assert that you have the ability to cut production or to control prices in the oil market. What you're actually saying is, is that we're seeing relatively weak demand. Therefore, we're trying to support prices, right? So I would be cautious in this. Likewise, you know, when you take somebody like MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, um, you know, who is a princeling who has been raised with a, you know, beyond silver, basically a platinum spoon in his mouth his entire life and was never told no by anyone, right? And is now suddenly facing a global stage in which his behavior and his perception as a reformer is not particularly well received. I would encourage people to just recognize you're talking about Louis the 16th, right? This yeah. is, you know, the, you know, the child who is basically saying, let them eat cake, you know, let them be excited that women can drive, um, let them be excited that we're building, you know, ski slopes in Saudi Arabia, outdoor ski slopes in Saudi Arabia, which is just an absurd use of capital. Um, not, you know, totally dissimilar to, you know, building the Petit Trianon at Versailles. So you know, when, you're, when, when you're looking at that sort of expenditure and those sort of behaviors and basically a rogue of, uh, you know, a, 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 a league of rogue villains in the form of Putin and uh, MBS and Xi, recognize that they're probably actually coming from a position of weakness more than anything else, that they're being crowded out. China has extraordinary challenges tied to its demographics, tied to its environment degradation. What they do have on the other side that America seems to have largely lost is its ability to make relatively hard choices, even if those are coming from the top. Right. Yeah, right? I think so, that goes that goes back to your point there with these kinds of uh, what might be seen seemingly uh, moves that are a, a bit more on, hey, we're going to look at maybe some chess moves here, play this out over the, the global stage. Do we potentially put some pressure on the United States just to kind of see whether or not the U.S. is capable of being able to respond? But at the same time, you've got credit uh, scenarios playing out here in the U.S., continuing, at least we think right now, where we may still continue to see a little bit of inflation play out. And whether or not Powell comes back in and starts to reverse these cuts, or if he reverses uh, interest into cuts, if you look at what Australia is, that is doing now, going to pause, maybe there's going to be some additional of the G20s that will start to go in this direction. With that being the case, playing out for the rest of the year, a lo still a lot of pressure within the markets. How do you see the markets responding to this right now with them believing that we're going to see potentially a pause or a rate cut coming soon? Well, I think we're seeing two elements of that. One is, is that the market is broadly what's being described as fight the Fed, right? So the rates market itself is anticipating cuts and pricing in cuts, even as the Fed insists that it is not entertaining either a pause or cuts. So how that plays out basically becomes a question of does something break in a big enough or large enough fashion to force Jerome Powell to reverse his activities? The, the second, um, you know, so obviously that would be, cons you know, it's something that is expressed as a bearish point of view. We're engaged in behavior that ultimately is going to break something before the policymakers change their behavior. Um, what that is, you know, I would suggest that the, the pressure that we're seeing in the banking system is kind of the first warning signs of it. And we're already beginning to see evidence of that in things like the ISM turning down, et cetera. It's just unprecedented to hike interest rates in the, in the face of what would be recessionary conditions, but yeah. we seem very intent on doing so, right? Um, if we continue to do that, unfortunately, there is, you know, people have used the analogy of adjusting a, uh, the temperature on a shower that is on the 30th floor when the water heater is on the bottom floor, right? It takes time for that change in temperature to come through. Sure. I think that's a really good analogy that is often overused, but certainly apt as it relates to interest rate hikes. It's a super broad tool that we don't really know where it always affects things, right? You're, you're changing basically the content of the oxygen in the atmosphere. We don't know who dies, right? Yeah. But somebody is going to die. It just becomes a question of, of is it us or is it our competitors? Because we're putting pressure, that shortage of dollars that we're creating with the hike in interest rates is putting pressure on countries like China as well, right? This, right. Is, this is why there's 
scrambling to come up with alternatives. It's why they're scrambling to try to get others to settle their currency without accessing the U.S. dollar, because candidly, they just don't have enough of them to spend. Yeah, and, and this is the, the key that will start to play into uh, the markets in general. This coming in from Bloomberg right here, claiming, you know, trading volatility, kind of the new reality for bond investors. Uh, and part of that was broke by double digit moves in the treasury yields. They're kind of bracing for another year of rocky, uh, kind of rocky trading here. How will this play out in, in traditional investments? You've got, I know you guys obviously uh, consult with your own clients, but if you look at people out there saying, all right, I'm moving money out of a bank. Uh, maybe I'm going into a brokerage account and playing a uh, money market, or maybe I'm going into gold, or maybe I'm going into Bitcoin, whatever the route may take. Volatility seems to be here for at least a short period of time. Where do you see this starting to come out for the savvy investors who are playing this? Because obviously this is going to create some opportunities. Well, I think you actually hit on some of the key components, right? Volatility basically causes people to not make choices, right? So if I'm really uncertain what a bond price is going to be next week, right? The volatility of that is high. And we've seen extraordinary moves in bonds over the last several weeks. In many situations, things like two-year bonds moving 25 basis points a day. Exactly. Like, that's just an extraordinary amount of volatility, right? It means that we really don't know what the actual price of money is. And if you don't really know what the value of the money that's sitting in your pocket is, you're much less likely to spend it. You're much less likely to tie it up for long term, right? When you tie it up for long term, that's what we call investing. And so you should yep. expect that people are going to leave investment opportunities and turn to things that they think of as cash or that they think of as solutions to that uncertainty. Bitcoin could be one of them. Gold could be another, right? Jim Grant has the very famous expression on gold where the price of gold is one over N, where N faith in central bankers. Yeah, We're discovering very quickly that central bankers are not quite as good as they thought they were. Right. So if, if, if they're not as good as they think they are, why should we have any faith in them? And I, I would suggest that the same thing plays through to Bitcoin. Right. Um, so, so those dynamics, I think, are very, very clearly in play. And I don't want to alarm people, but these are the characteristics that precede every crisis that we have. When you just yep. don't know how much the dollar in your wallet is worth. You know, if you're convinced it's going to zero, you're going to spend it quickly. You'll get the, you know, the money dilute, the money illusion. You'll think that you're buying stuff and that there's a lot of demand for things. And it's really people just trying to get out of the dollar. On yeah. the flip side of that, if you're really not sure where your next dollar is going to come from, and that's what a recession means, right? Recession means that you have uncertainty as to your income levels. You have uncertainty in terms of the consistency of the cash flows that come in. Will I have a job next week? Will I have unexpected? Affected, you know, expenses, it becomes very difficult to budget or plan around that. And the tightening up of those conditions is what we refer to as a recession. Mike, you, you talk about central bankers here. This was a piece in from uh, Financial Times. Central bankers warn on company, you know, fatter profit margins. And a lot of people look at the inflationary scenarios that are facing the United States really down to a couple of things. One, of course, the big one is corporate greed. Lot, a lot more major companies making a lot more money, including Jamie Dimon and many of the others in the banking systems out there reporting highest profits ever. We're seeing this in the retail sector. We're seeing this in food and beverage services. Is there a potential of how this, these companies could potentially adjust into this economy going forward? Or do you think we're going to be looking at scenarios where we see potential hyperinflationary scenarios playing out, both on goods and services, but maybe within the market itself? So I think hyperinflationary conditions are challenging, right? They can happen, but they typically occur because there's been a dramatic loss of production capacity. In, in Zimbabwe, for example, the nationalization of farms that were owned by white farmers and then subsequently distributed to much smaller black landowners or uh, to be landowners, lowered the productivity of Zimbabwe's food production, created conditions under which they suddenly needed to import basic foodstuffs as compared to exporting. What's called the terms of trade shifted very rapidly and that created conditions under which Zimbabwe basically faced starvation 
or to you know sell a ton of Zimbabwean dollars in order to finance the purchases of foreign goods, right? So when you when you have that type of component, or the Germans losing access to productive capability in the aftermath of World War One, and being forced to at the same time service debts, those create the hyperinflationary conditions. We're not really seeing any real sign of that in the United States, it, you know. So I'm I'm skeptical on the ideas of hyperinflation. That doesn't mean they can't happen, but it means they're unlikely to happen. The other component that I would suggest. On, on, on the inflation front, though, is, is that when you choose to, to address inflationary pressures by hiking interest rates, that's something we only tried once before in the 1970s, and it failed miserably. Yeah. The solution to shortage-induced um, inflation, in other words, there's not enough cars, there's not enough houses, there's not enough of what people ultimately want, is to increase investment. In general, that requires stable or lower interest rates which is what we did in the 1920s when it fixed itself, which is what we did in the 1940s when inflationary episodes in the aftermath and, and uh, in the aftermath of World War II emerged. We encouraged companies to invest and increase production. We're just not doing that this time, right? We're pursuing yeah. the same failed policies that we had in the 1970s. And that means that when the economy starts growing again, we could very well see another burst of inflation. I just think we're, you know, we've engaged in poor policy choices and when we engage in poor policy choices, we're going to get poor outcomes. Well, and, and to your point, uh, looking at this chart here, this was all the way back to 1945 uh, when we saw that. This is in reference to companies' profitability. And, and back in, in pre-war, uh, you saw massive uh, profitability in, in a lot of corporations. Obviously, that dipped all the way down in here to COVID period of times. And, and this was dot bomb in 2000. We saw this dip right here. Uh, right here during the COVID pandemic, and then this skyrocket right after. All of that could boil down to where consumer demand just starts retracing, much like what it did in the 1940s and 50s, where we started to see uh, a downward trend in company growth. Back to your point is that there's not a lot of investment. Now you've got credit pushing in on this. This could be a period of time that could be more than a decade of slower company growth, slower uh, wage growth, job growth, all of those kind of things playing out. Where would investors look for safe harbor during that kind of period? So the thing I guess I would encourage people to remember is, is that at the end of the day, the government gets financed first, right? And that's really what you're seeing. You're seeing pressure on the banking yeah. system as the government has raised interest rates to the level that people are saying something along the lines of what a deal, right? I can't believe that I'm getting risk-free 5% yield. Um, if, you know, the same thing happened in the 1940s and 1950s, the difference was that the government took some of those proceeds, took some of that largesse and encouraged companies to invest, created conditions under which there were very positive externalities for making investments. Um, the retooling of America, the support for residential construction. Anyone who lives in New York City is familiar with Peter Cooper's Stuyvesant Town, the Stuyvesant Village, Peter Cooper Village, Stuyvesant Town, right? Those were built with the support of the US government. The GI Bill facilitated returning um, soldiers, buying homes in various places. And no, it was not a perfect program. Yes, there were lots of flaws, lots of racism, et cetera, components uh, that, that played a role there. But ultimately, the government encouraged great choices. In this situation, the government seems to be encouraging terrible choices, right? We're going to do everything we can to support your base level of consumption. We're going to talk about ridiculous things like universal basic income as compared to saying to people, hey, here's really effective ways that could use the resources in this country. We're just doing a bad yeah. job of it, right? And eventually, we're going to realize that if we continue to do a bad job, we start to run out of resources, and then you really have sustained inflation. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is going to be here because it really depends on the choices that we make, right? If we decide that we want to get serious, right, to steal from John Stewart or Bill Maher, et cetera, if we want to become a serious people again and say, here are the investments that we care about. We care about educating our children. We care about making yeah. sure that nutrition is occurring. We make sure that the government is not overstepping its bounds in terms of the limitations that it's placing on private actions. 
then we could get great outcomes because America is really uniquely positioned. We've got you know environmental resources in the form of a you know broadly protected moat that simply don't exist in other places around the world, but we're really wasting it. And you know, a lot of it boils down to not properly measuring those resources. Last question for you, Mike. Uh, Trading Group put out a nice little piece here. It says, pick one to hold for the rest of the year. They had Bitcoin, gold, stocks, and cash with a quick, a, a quick chart you know, on performance. When you look at those right now, obviously cash, I would say I'd probably flip that into maybe money markets because that's performing the best. Yeah, that's what it very, is. Yeah. Right. So where where do you like this right now? Is that is that pretty much your position? Is cash is is king right now, or are you playing the gold stocks or Bitcoin markets? So the only thing that I would add to this, if I were to put up a chart, is credit, right? Um, the credit market, credit spreads, etc. That's probably the one that I see is at the greatest risk. But that spreads through all the other risk assets, Bitcoin, gold, right. etc. You know, when it comes down to feeding your family, making your mortgage payment, making your car payment, et cetera, the only thing you can use is cash. And so that is, if I'm correct, in terms of the forecast of a slowing economy and tightening credit conditions, cash is likely a performing asset. That is largely how I've positioned my portfolios. Um, and it, you know, think that there's a real opportunity that is being presented to people here. On the flip side of that, though, again, if the government chooses to respond as they did in 2020 with extraordinary stimulus, it seems very hard to do in the presence of the of um, the debt ceiling debates and a divided Congress and the lack of a very tangible emergency in the form of COVID. All right. So if we avoid doing that, then we're likely to see this credit crisis and the tightening of conditions that favor cash. If on the flip side of it, we suddenly decide that we're going to go right back to spending, then, you know, you'll see all the other assets work and cash will be the wrong call. Yeah. So it, yeah. It, like we really are at a what's, you know, what's referred Very, to as a, a fork in the road. Yeah, it's know. a crossroad for sure. Yeah, for sure. Let's flip over to the poll, see what the audience is thinking today. Uh, all right. Obviously, our audience <laughs> very heavy in Bitcoin. <laughs> Real estate stocks and uh, gold, precious metals. Uh, and again, I think we probably put a sh should have put uh, cash and money market in there because that's obviously paying near five percent right now, which is pretty decent, you know, considering many people are in and out of these. But uh, Mike, it has been great having you on the show. We always love to get new voices here on our network. We are obviously big into blockchain, but we're also big into just strategy, watching the market maneuvers because there's a lot of opportunity out there. So we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for stopping in. It was a pleasure being here, Paul. Thank you very much for the invitation. You bet. All right. So you guys are tuned in maybe over on the podcast side of things right now. Sometimes we'll do these kinds of interviews. We'll get into charts and we take a look at the global aspect of not only investing, but technology and even society and what the impacts of how you are doing things out there, whether it's investing, buying real estate, getting into Bitcoin or crypto, looking at gold. I mean, we've got now Peter Schiff, I think, even coming onto the show soon. So we want to give you guys a full 360, and I'd love to get your input. Do you like it? Uh, if so, just drop some comments down below. Let us know. And if you have some ideas for, hey, we should have this guy on or this individual or this company, drop those down below. We always read our comments out there. If you're not part of the Diamond Circle, make sure and jump in. It's a very easy thing to do. It is our mailing list. And it's a great way for you guys to get additional content from us that doesn't land here on YouTube. If you want to reach me, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.